So we've explored what work-life balance is, but now you might be asking, how can I achieve it? Enter the concept of boundary management. This term refers to the strategies we can adopt to facilitate a harmonious blend of work and life. One straightforward boundary management tactic is segmentation. Picture this, you head to work, leave your personal life at the door and focus solely on your professional tasks. When the workday ends, you switch off your work brain, leaving work behind both physically and mentally. This approach fosters clear cut boundaries, keeping your work and your personal life distinct. At its extreme, segmenters may not even mingle socially with coworkers. On the flip side, we have integration. This approach involves fusing your work and your personal life. Integrators are the ones who don't mind working late nights or tackling work tasks during their personal time. They're also comfortable allowing their personal lives to bleed into their work time, perhaps meeting a friend for lunch or responding to personal emails while they're on the clock. In this strategy, boundaries are intentionally blurred. A third approach is compensation. This strategy is more dynamic and flexible. Sometimes your work might take precedence, say during a crucial project deadline. During these periods, work may spill over into personal life a bit more. At other times, personal life takes the lead, for instance, when welcoming a new baby into the family. Here, personal life may seep into work hours. Compensation involves adaptively responding to varying demands, channeling your focus where it's most needed. Now let's look at some real life data. Google conducted a survey among its employees and found that 31% identified as segmenters, while 69% identified as integrators. The segmenters were able to mentally separate work stress from the rest of their lives. Regardless of looming deadlines or a flood of emails, they managed to drift off to sleep peacefully each night. The integrators, on the other hand, had work consistently looming in the background. They often found themselves refreshing their work emails late into the night, checking for new tasks. Interestingly, despite the majority identifying as integrators, many integrators expressed a desire to improve at segmentation. It seems that even for those comfortable with blurring boundaries, there's perceived value in maintaining some separation between work and personal life. Google's take on this? The notion of a perfect work-life balance is a myth. There's no one size fits all. However, they acknowledge that organizations have a responsibility to support their employees' pursuit of work-life balance. For example, Google's Dublin office initiated a program called Dublin Goes Dark, where employees were encouraged to leave their mobile devices at work before heading home. The anecdotal feedback? Participants reported blissful and stress-free evenings, finding it easier to switch off from work. So this research recognizes that switching off is really important. But how do we actually do that? How do we effectively recover and recharge when we're off the clock? How can we bounce back fresh and ready for the next day of work? This leads us to the study of psychological detachment. Psychological detachment is all about creating a mental buffer between you and your work situation, not just physically, but mentally too. It's about resisting the urge to mull over work-related matters when you're home, trying to relax and enjoy your free time. So how can you master this art of psychological detachment? Here are a few suggestions. First up, detachment itself. Avoid work-related activities like checking emails. But it's not just about avoiding work tasks. It's also about establishing rituals that signify the end of your workday. Maybe it's about changing out of your work clothes, or if you work from home, taking a short walk to mentally commute away from your workspace. Second, make time to relax. Engage in leisure activities that help you unwind, whether it's reading a book, practicing yoga, or soaking in a bath. Find what helps you decompress. Third, get challenged. Doing something active like playing a sport or pursuing a creative hobby can be beneficial. The aim is to engage in something that absorbs you, challenges you, and helps you develop a sense of proficiency or mastery. These detachment experiences are crucial because they allow you to immerse yourself fully in non-work activities. This immersion replaces job-related thoughts, negative or otherwise, with other engagements. Now you might be wondering, what kind of activity should I do? The research doesn't point to a one-size-fits-all answer. But there are some general trends. Active pursuits like exercise and social activities typically have a beneficial effect. 
On the other hand, more passive activities like watching TV tend to be less effective. The consensus leans towards active recovery activities as they promote psychological attachment more fully. These activities create a mental distance from work, reducing the likelihood of ruminating over work-related issues, and thus providing the best opportunity to recharge. This research mainly focuses on day-to-day -day recovery experiences. But what happens when the stress gets too much and you're already feeling burnt out? How do you bounce back then? In such cases, it's even more crucial to establish a firm boundary between your work and personal time. That means no peeking at work emails, no after work calls, basically no work-related activities whatsoever when you're off the clock. According to researchers Orlemans and Bacher, the first step in combating burnout is engaging in more passive, low effort activities. Think along the lines of relaxing, meditating, reading, or even simply doing nothing. When you're facing burnout, you're often too exhausted for more active pursuits. While active recovery activities are generally beneficial for day-to-day -day stress relief, the more passive ones take precedence in the face of burnout. And another conclusion that comes out of this research, don't underestimate the power of social activities. Engage in meaningful conversations with friends or family. Whether it's a night out with friends, a visit to your family, or a phone call to a loved one, human connection can be a powerful antidote to burnout. The key is to engage with the world outside of your work with activities that replenish your energy and restore your spirit. Now let's look at recovery from a different angle. There's been an emerging interest in not just how we recharge after work, but how we keep our energy levels up while we're actually at work. Past research has looked at off the job recovery activities, but what about energy management strategies on the job? An interesting study dove into this, asking workers how they keep their vitality up and fatigue down during the workday. The researchers identified 42 different strategies, which they categorized into work-related strategies and micro-break strategies. Work-related strategies involve tweaking how you work. For example, you might switch tasks when you feel your focus slipping, or create to-do lists so you're not juggling all your tasks in your head at once. Micro-break strategies, on the other hand, are like mini pit stops in your workday. You could grab a snack, go for a walk, or simply rest a moment. However, the study found that employees often only take these micro-breaks when they're already feeling worn out. So a hot tip here is to start taking these breaks earlier to prevent fatigue from setting in. While these insights were enlightening, the study was what we call a cross-sectional survey. It's a single snapshot of the different strategies people use. It doesn't actually follow people over time and examine how effective these strategies are at alleviating fatigue. So another study, which was conducted right here at UQ, led by Hannes Zacher, decided to take it a step further. In this study, over 100 managerial, administrative, and professional staff at UQ were tracked for an entire day with hourly surveys recording which strategies they used and their levels of vitality and fatigue. Here's what they found. If people took micro breaks, they felt less fatigued and more energized in the next hour. Work-related strategies didn't show this immediate effect. However, people who often use work-related strategies like making lists or switching tasks tended to feel more vital overall. It seems that while work-related strategies may not give an immediate boost, they pay off in the long run. Now, you might be wondering which strategies were most effective. Turns out that the micro breaks that were best at cutting down fatigue included taking a caffeine break, a bathroom break, walking, stretching, chatting, or checking in with someone outside of work, like a friend or a family member. To boost vitality, drinking water, snacking, getting some fresh air, gazing out the window, or again, talking to someone were the top strategies. In a nutshell, micro breaks act as a quick energy shot during your workday, providing short-term relief from fatigue and a quick vitality boost. Work-related strategies, on the other hand, may not provide an immediate jolt of energy, partly because they require some effort to implement. It's like investing energy now to save more later. So even though work-related strategies might feel like extra work initially, they're a good long-term energy investment plan, paying off over time with sustained vitality. So remember, maintaining work-life balance isn't just about recharging after work, but also effectively managing your energy during work. 
Let's take a look at another study, this one by de Bloom and colleagues in 2015, which adds another layer to our understanding of work-life balance. This research aimed to investigate the interaction between energy management at work and recovery experiences at home. They did so by surveying a whopping 1,200 employees. They found that those who frequently used work-related energy management strategies and took micro breaks at work tended to have more psychological detachment, relaxation, and mastery experiences after work. So picture energy management at work as a kind of warm-up for your downtime after work. By effectively managing your energy while on the job, you're setting yourself up for a more successful recovery process when you clock out. If you've strategically saved your energy during the workday, you'll find it easier to kick back and truly relax in the evening because you've still got enough juice left in the tank. And here's where it gets even more interesting. The study found that both energy management strategies during work and post-work recovery practices contributed positively to employees' overall health engagement, and work performance. So it's a win-win situation. By taking care of yourself both at work and at home, you're not just improving your personal well-being, you're also becoming a more effective, engaged, and productive employee or student. Now let's talk about a modern day challenge in the realm of work-life balance, the blurred lines between our work life and our home life. This has become especially relevant as more and more people are working at different times and in different spaces. Now, some organizations have tried to mitigate this issue by introducing things like a compressed work week. This is where you complete a standard 40 hour work week over fewer days. Picture it like binge studying for your exams or trying to write a full assignment in a day. You're going all in during that time, but then you have a longer break to recuperate. You might see this in practice with professions like doctors or pilots. Alternatively, some workplaces offer what's called flexi time. Employees can set their own hours instead of adhering to the traditional nine to five schedule. A classic meta-analysis on these practices suggested that both can be beneficial for a range of recovery outcomes. But interestingly, research suggests that there's such a thing as too much flexibility. It's like when you have an entire day to study and somehow it's midnight and you've only read two pages. Too much freedom and lack of structure can actually be less effective. Moreover, the benefits of flexi time might be dwindling over time. With our smartphones and laptops always within reach, we're able to connect to work 24 seven, which can make it harder to truly disconnect and relax. Now, what about working from different locations? Early research by IBM showed that telecommuters people working from home, had better outcomes in terms of performance, motivation, and work-life balance than their office-bound counterparts. This was replicated during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, where Microsoft found that their employees were happier working from home. But as we moved through the pandemic, it was interesting to see how these preferences evolved. It's an open question as to whether employees might actually have become burnt out from working from home. A meta-analysis from 2007 that covered 46 studies and 12,000 workers showed beneficial effects of working from home without detrimental effects on work relationships, as long as remote work didn't exceed half the time. Interestingly, one study by Melner in 2017 compared working across time, so choosing your own work hours, with working across spaces, working from different locations. It found that working whenever you want can lead to longer work hours and less detachment. In contrast, working from different locations tend to result in shorter work hours and didn't affect the ability to disconnect from work. So finding the right combination of when and where you work can improve your work-life balance and overall well-being. Let's explore the different ways organizations can support work-life balance and help their employees thrive. Organizations can adopt time-based strategies like flexi time or compressed work weeks. Imagine if Robbie, the construction worker's company, allowed them to work longer hours across fewer days, providing more consecutive days off to rest and spend time with the family. Organizations can also introduce job sharing, where multiple people share the same role. So Ravi might work the morning shift and another worker takes over in the afternoon, reducing Ravi's daily workload. Organizations might also offer parental leave or work from home arrangements if that's possible. They can also provide services such as childcare, gyms, health services, and financial services. 
On a broader level, organizations can focus on cultivating a culture that promotes balance. This involves monitoring workloads, minimizing work-related travel, offering incentives for achieving work-life balance, and training managers on diversity and remote team leadership. Now, you might think that providing these services will automatically resolve work-life conflicts for employees. Surprisingly, research shows that simply offering these services isn't enough to eliminate conflicts. However, it does positively impact employees' attitudes and behavioral outcomes. Why? When an organization offers these services, it signals to employees that the company cares about them. This attracts employees to the organization and encourages them to stay, even if they don't actually use these services. Moreover, managerial support and a positive work-life climate within the organization can strengthen the link between the provision of work-life practices and employees' perceptions of organizational support. A meta-analysis on the topic of work-life balance policies, specifically focusing on family care support, found that both the availability and use of these services are related to positive outcomes such as job satisfaction, effective commitment, and intention to stay in the organization. Interestingly, the availability of these services was a stronger predictor of positive outcomes than their actual use. This study also found that using these services did reduce work-family conflict, which contributed to the positive outcomes. So while simply offering these services might not eliminate work-life conflict, when these services are used, they do play a significant role in improving employees' experiences and creating a healthier work environment. It's also important to distinguish between formal and informal organizational support. You might think that the official policies and services offered by the organizations are the primary drivers of work-life harmony, but the reality might surprise you. A 2020 study by French and Shockley found that informal support, those conversations with understanding colleagues, sympathetic mentors, or even people at home, can actually have a bigger impact on facilitating positive work-family outcomes than formal policies. Think about it this way. You're cramming for exams and your housemate offers to take care of the chores for a week. That's a kind of informal support that can make a real difference. Now, imagine something similar happening in a workplace setting. In particular, having a supportive supervisor can make a world of difference. You know, the kind who understands if you need to leave early once in a while to take care of personal obligations. Or an organization that endorses the idea of segmentation, allowing you to switch off from work mode when you clock out. This combo seems to be a winning recipe for maintaining work-life balance. There are also some innovative ways that employees themselves can better integrate their work and personal lives. There's a concept called the I-Deal, short for idiosyncratic deal. Basically, it's where employees negotiate unique conditions for their employment with their supervisor. For example, you have to pick up your child from school at 3 p.m. on Tuesdays. You arrange with your boss to leave work early on those days. That's an ideal. Plus, there's job crafting and life crafting. Remember, we touched on job crafting in an earlier video. It's all about shaping your job to fit seamlessly with your life. It's like customizing your university schedule to avoid 8 a.m. tutorials, but in the professional world. This way, you're not just surviving the work-life juggling act, you're actually shaping it. So, as we wrap up our deep dive into work-life balance, let's recap what we discussed. We kick things off by journeying through the various theories and historical perspectives that underpin our understanding of work-life balance. Remember the spillover theory? That's the one where experiences in one domain, like work, seep into another, like home, impacting our mood and behavior. We grappled with the role strain hypothesis, which highlights the stress and tension of juggling multiple roles, student, employee, friend, and how this can create work-family conflict, which arises when work and family roles pull us in different directions. We then explored the positives that come from having multiple roles. We touched on work-family enrichment, where positive experiences at work actually boost our home life and vice versa, and the role enhancement theory, which suggests that having multiple roles can actually be beneficial. We also examined work-life balance from the perspective of conservation of resources theory, which illustrates how we thrive to retain, protect, and build resources, and how stress occurs when those resources are threatened or lost. We then navigated the evolving definitions of work-life balance, 
it's not just about splitting time equally between work and life anymore. It's about whether a person feels that their work environment aligns with their goals and values. Next, we delved into what you as individuals can do to cultivate work-life balance. This is where boundary management came into play, the art of creating mental, physical, and temporal boundaries between work and personal life. We also discussed the significance of recovery, both after work and during work, highlighting the importance of micro breaks and work-related strategies that help recharge your batteries. Finally, we turned the lens towards organizations. We explored how companies can facilitate work-life balance, from offering flexi time and compressed work weeks to implementing formal and informal support systems. So that's it for our tour through the world of work-life balance. I look forward to seeing you in the lecture debrief.